Well, joining me now live is the chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee, Liberal Senator James Patterson. James, good to see you. A Confucius Institute's just seen as a proper propaganda arm of China. I think our universities need to think very carefully themselves, independent of whatever the foreign minister may decide to do with Confucius Institutes, about whether it really is consistent with their own values as open, free society based academic institutions to have a foreign authoritarian government funding an institute on their campus. Now, the Chinese government, of course, says uh, that the only purpose of the Confucius Institutes is to promote understanding uh, and to teach Chinese language. Um, I'm sceptical about those claims. I think they play another role. And I know in speaking to dissident students from mainland China or Hong Kong or Taiwan, that they say that they feel unsafe being on a campus that has a Confucius Institute there. And I think that's not an unreasonable feeling for th that they have. OK, so why do these universities sign up? Is it a lucrative investment for them? In and of itself, I don't think the Confucius Institute agreements are particularly lucrative for universities. There is funding that comes direct from the Chinese government for it, but in the scheme of a large in institution that has a billion dollars of revenue, it's not a huge amount of money. Mm. I think universities have done so because they think it's about engagement with China and the Chinese government, and they think that other things will flow from it, like large numbers of Chinese international students or other research agreements. I think they think it will uh, grease the wheels, if you like, of yeah. that uh, relationship. And I think many universities have not managed that relationship relationship prudently. They've exposed themselves to serious financial and other risks. Well, we've seen that risk as COVID hit and international students haven't been able to get to Australia and universities that rely on that are bleeding. Indeed, state governments are as well. But we've got this situation now where, James, mm. that universities have lost international students, governments have cut growth in funding, your government, I should say, and now you're telling them they need to um, really monetise better their research. I mean, universities are finding it very tough at the moment. Is there something the government can do to stop stop them needing to rely on the Chinese dollar in this way? Universities have a great tendency, Laura, to be vocal in the media and to complain about their plight. But let's remember these are very well-funded institutions. They receive about $18 billion of taxpayers' money every year to fund their domestic student uh, enrolment and their research. And the federal government at the beginning of COVID-19 guaranteed that funding, that it wouldn't dip, even if their student enrolments dipped. Mm -hmm. A university said at the time they really needed to access JobKeeper and they made a lot of complaints about that. We've since learned over the last few months that many of these universities have posted certain surpluses and some of them very significant surpluses which demonstrate actually the hit that they said that would come to their revenue and their mm. finances did not come this financial year. But just now, to I don't doubt that in that, future James years Patterson, there will be an impact yeah, on international the, students. The future mm. year thing is the issue because while students are enrolled here if they can't get here you know their, their programs and their courses might go for the next two or three years but then universities warn it will fall off a cliff and that's a real problem isn't it and it's, mm. it's a reality. Look I, I partly agree with you, Laura, and I do acknowledge that, but that wasn't what universities were saying in February or March or April last year. They were saying that they urgently needed JobKeeper, and I think uh, their claims have been exposed a bit there. I think they are the boy that cried wolf in relation to JobKeeper, and I think we should take all their future claims with a degree of scepticism, because what we discovered is mm. many international students did make it in, in time for semester one last year, and many others have decided to continue to study online, and the government has facilitated that by not penalising them for their visa requirements, for example. Uh, so so universities are in nowhere near as dire a situation as they claim they have been, and they have choices to make. They have choices about whether or not they pay their vice chancellors multi-million dollar salaries, whether they spend big on sponsoring sporting teams and taking out ads at bus stops. They have choices about whether they go on the building spree that many of them have gone on in recent years. And some universities have managed these risks better than others. They have more diversified international student markets, but some of them have gone all in on the Chinese international student market mm. in particular, to the exclusion of all others, and they were warned about that. There were many independent research reports that said that was a risky thing to do and lo and behold it has been. Okay well let's look at the Belt and Road Initiative more broadly. Do you expect China, China to react angrily to this? We've seen a war of words. What form do you expect a backlash to come in? 
Well, we don't know, Laura. The Chinese embassy and the Chinese government uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson has warned that there will be uh, further retaliatory action against Australia for taking this move. If that is the case, that would be very disappointing because uh, it is a sovereign matter for Australia to decide how we engage with the world. And I think it's an entirely reasonable proposition that the federal government should be the starting point, the entry point for anyone who wants to do business with Australia. We welcome international engagement, but we just don't want people going around behind our backs to state governments, local councils or universities with without consulting Canberra as they should. Uh, so the fact that China is the only country which is objected to this policy, even though it applies to every other country in the world, says something about the way in which they view their relationship with, with Australia. Well, uh, it is possible that further trade strikes will... Sorry. As... No, continue, please. Yeah, it's possible, Laura, that further trade strikes will come. We have seen that in the past. And I am concerned on behalf of those industries that have not yet been targeted that they might be targeted. One thing they can take some encouragement from, though, is that the Chinese government's tactics have been spectacularly unsuccessful. Almost all the product categories singled out for tariffs, with the exception yeah. of wine, have found other markets uh, relatively quickly and relatively easily. And that's very encouraging for Australians because it shows that we can diversify uh, our exports and that our products are in high demand around the world. Yeah. Yep, and China needs us for our iron ore and the dollars tell us that. The numbers don't lie there. But China has accused Australia of deploying Cold War tactics. What's your response to that? Uh, the, this, there's nothing further from the truth. The Australian government has no uh, interest in engaging in a Cold War with China or any other country. We are not the ones that have sought to politicise our trading arrangements. We haven't put any tariffs on Chinese goods or Chinese products that come here. Uh, we absolutely accept and understand that Australian businesses should be free to trade with countries that have different political systems to ours, and we haven't sought to do that. There's only one country that sought to impose its political will using its economic power, and that's the Chinese government. So if anyone's engaging in Cold War tariffs, Tactics. I don't think it's us. OK, just one final question on your colleague, George Christensen. He's going to retire at the election. Are you surprised? I'm a little bit surprised because I thought uh, George seemed to really enjoy what he does as a federal member of parliament. He's very passionate about the causes that are close to his heart. There have been many things that George and I have agreed on and beat on the trenches beside. There have been some things uh, we disagreed on, and either, but either way, whether we've been for each other or against each other, I really respect him as a colleague. I know he gets a rough time in the media and, and he's been subject to a lot of criticism, but he's very sincere about what he does. He very, cares very much about the people he represents and I think he will be a loss to the federal parliament. Well, he's issued uh, somewhat of a... Well, you might take it as a threat. He's pro pro promised to speak out and saying, well, he's no longer burdened by the need to be re-elected. What do you think he'll do there? It doesn't sound much different to the George that I know of over the last decade, Laura. I don't think you could accuse him of ever being shy or quiet or retiring about his views. I'm sure he'll share them as he has in recent years. His loss could be a problem in Queensland, couldn't it? He certainly built up a, a very healthy margin uh, in his seat of Dawson. I think it, last time I checked it's over 14% and that's a tribute to him because it has previously been held by Labor. It was previously a marginal seat. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it, as well as the support for George locally, I think there's support for the government's policies locally. And I think that uh, Queenslanders in, in central northern Queensland in particular uh, really rejected the war on aspiration that the Labor Party took to the last election, uh, really rejected the war on resources uh, and coal that they took to the last election. Yeah. And if they take anything like that sort of policies to the next election, I think we'll comfortably win Dawson too. OK, we'll see. Time will tell. James Patterson, good to see you.